Okay, let's say welcome. Welcome. It's a great day to be here talking with my good buddy, the Bradster. And Bradster, a top of the Lord's day to you, my friend. We just came off a good weekend. And uh, now you and I are back here with the opportunity to talk about the good things of God. And brother, that is its own reward, isn't it? Is it not? (laughs) It's always a reward to get together and talk to brothers that actually concern themselves with the word of God because God first concerned himself with them. We know that we are not chosen by our belief, but we are given belief. Therefore, we're chosen. Amen. Amen, brother. Now, you and I have this opportunity today to do an interesting deep dive, and I'm going to let you introduce the topic of the Apostles' Creed and why it's such an interesting creed to study. For the people, the background is that the Apostles' Creed is one of the most historically recognized ecumenical creeds in all of Christendom. Now, I don't know that any one creed unites all of Christianity, but this creed is probably the one that more people subscribe to over any other. And it brings up the idea and the topic of why do we even need creeds? What's their use? What's their value? What's their benefits? What's their drawbacks? Is there a reason why we could get in trouble holding a creed, for example? And so this is a really interesting topic. And Bradster, I'm so glad you uh, thought to bring it up. And we're going to try to tie it in with maybe some interesting historical developments in the Reformed camp that have come down through the centuries. So Bradster, how would you start talking to somebody about this topic of creeds and confessing, holding to a statement of faith, and and what that all implies? Well, whenever we evangelize, that's the first thing that needs to be in mind here. What are we going to say? What is the gospel? We're going to start making claims. This is what the gospel is. We're going to start making claims that people either have a collaboration effort to come to Christ from a sickness, or they are spiritually dead and Christ has brought them to life. So we're going to have topics that come up. People are going to want to know what these things are. And believe it or not, if they show any interest, they have searched the web. And what by searching the web, they have people that believe different things. So whenever you believe those different things, they get categorized under certain headings, such as, i.e., Calvinist. We believe TULIP total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. We would believe on different distinctives how far we go with creedalizing those distinctives. The Apostles' Creed comes up. Yesterday, I was in a Dutch Reformed church. In the Dutch Reformed tradition, what you have is them telling you, hey, this is the mark of belief. This is the mark of true belief the Apostles' Creed. And for an American evangelical Christian, when you hear this, it comes off really awkward. But then when you actually read what the Creed is saying, it's not that I have any objections that I am in the body of Christ, the Holy Catholic Church, that I am a Trinitarian, as proclaimed in the Creed, that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, as proclaimed in the Creed. But Is it mandatory for a Christian to be called a Christian based on the reciting or the willingness to recite from and embrace that creed over their confession in and of Scripture? That is such a beautiful summarization of the issue, brother, and I thank you for making it so clear. You and I were talking about a situation that comes up fairly often when each of us are talking with people about the Lord, and that is particulars of doctrine. And so you have this idea or this situation that you wish to go and bring the good news of the gospel to a lost world. You say to yourself, the Great Commission applies to me. I'm to go and proclaim. Speak the good things of God, the clean things of God. Christ has come. He has paid the debt of sin. And brother, a lot of value that can come from a creedless gospel presentation. If somebody has never heard anything about the Christian faith before, there's a lot of high-level things that you can say that you don't strictly need a creedal statement to be behind you. 
But what happens is after that first introduction, and maybe after what you could call a honey, honeymoon phase. So there's this honeymoon phase where you're talking to somebody about Christ who's never heard about Christ for, at all. And you're introducing everything for the first time. And while that mind is open, while that mind is fresh, while that mind is interested, you want to say the most important thing about Christ. You want to tell of his goodness and his love. You want to talk about the nature of sin and human wickedness. You want to tell about, you know, the eternal punishment that comes for sinners who are not in Christ. We want to tell about how Jesus came and how it was that he purchased salvation for a particular elect group of people. There's, you want to tell these things, but what happens is very quickly in a listener, you can run into Jesus fatigue where, wait, wait, what's going on? I just wanted a simple gospel message and now you're confusing me with all of these issues. And a lot of people feel like, wow, I have to be, I have to be a historian just to even know whether or not I want this Christian faith. And so you want to present something simple, but you also want to present the correct essence of Christianity. And so you and I were talking about family members who have a credible profession of faith, who love the Lord, not calling their faith into question, and, but at the same time, when it comes to these particulars, when it comes to hanging the hat on a specific creed or a specific doctrinal position or a system of thought, a lot of believers are very reluctant, and they'll say, well, why can't I just worship Jesus? Why do I have to learn all of these things? And Bradster, I think that's something that matters to a lot of people. So when, when you're in that situation— what are some of the things that come to your mind that where you look to the creeds and confessions of the faith for value, for strength, for understanding? First of all, I would say it like this. I'm not going to open up a pop open the trunk and get my creed out and say, I love John Calvin. John Calvin is my God. I believe John Calvin wrote the Bible. John Calvin is the ruler of the world. It actually says nothing like that whatsoever. So what we actually have is teachings that line up with one of the tr most tremendous men of the faith named John Calvin. Now, this is the interesting thing. What was John Calvin anti? He was anti going beyond scriptures. So therefore, why does John Calvin use a catechism and creed? Because he, like me and you, introducing the subject, know that when we talk to these guys, when we talk to these gals, what's going to end up happening is we're going to teach them. Their words have meaning, just as our answers have meaning. If our answers don't portray the God of Scripture, then our answers lack truth. And if I speak truth, then I agree with the scriptures. Therefore, there are lanes. Whenever we do spiritual gift conversations, we have cessationism and continuationism, or just full-blown heresy outside of that. Well, and then, and that's another thing. What has never been thought of? What has never been accepted? These things are called guideposts, historical guideposts. This has never been thought in the history of Christianity. Throw it out the window. Why even waste your time with nonsense and psychobabble? <laughs> no, we don't do that. We go back to what has always been historically believed at its best. So that matters. That's the standard. God is the standard, and therefore he moved men with the scripture. He pinned down through men these scriptures as he carried them with the Holy Spirit of God. Now, Whenever I talk to somebody that is new, I'm not going to tell them Calvinism or Arminianism because, like you said, I'm making a proposal. Here, come to the wedding. Come to the wedding. Come to the wedding. And then once that honeymoon's over, as J.C. Bear says, they're going to want to kind of, mm, I don't know, know something. They're going to want to be certain. There's going to be some bold statements of truth coming from their lips or denials thereof. And then we could even get divorces down the road. Then we could even get more children. Then we get well-established. I mean, it really goes one way or another. The sheep do sheep things and goats do goat things. Now, the question is this. How broad is the way 
for sheep and how narrow are we if we call them goats for not agreeing with our creeds and confessions because they teach us what we have taught and expressed from the expounding of Holy Scripture. I'm glad you put it into those words, brother, because there really is a lot on the line. And I want to emphasize to our listeners, you mentioned this idea that I've heard a hundred times if I've heard it once, and that is this sort of dismissive, passive-aggressive, you just worship John Calvin. And I wouldn't say it's infuriating because it's not my bad. It's not on me if that's passive-aggressive. What I think is is important, though, is to remember that we who have a gospel to share have to share a truthful gospel. And if there's anything that wants, that the world wishes to do, it is to obscure the true gospel in the winds, in the fog of history. And so this idea that, so first of all, let me talk about the you worship John Calvin objection. That is, that just strikes me, brother, as a form of passive aggressiveness. First of all, when somebody says that, look, I just move on. I don't mean any animus. I don't mean any ill will to that person. I actually want to thank them in a way because they've said ahead of time, look, nothing profitable you can say to me because I've taken a stance that is against your approach, J.C. Bear. And I should just thank them because that is just a really polite way of saying you're wasting your time to talk with me. Oh, in that sense, of course, look, I'm sad. I'm also a little bit under the collar burned because it's very frustrating to hear somebody just marginalized everything you've done to try to make the gospel clearly presented to just to get that kind of response. Having said that, it's just a it's just a time to move on. I think one of the things that I want to think about is why might people say that? So first of all, let's take their accusation at face value. A- am I really worshiping John Calvin or, or, or Brad Story? These are things that we actually do have to do a little bit of work. And I would say this much. I suppose that it could be possible for a Calvinist to overemphasize the role of a theologian like a John Calvin. Now, I say possible. It's also possible to overdose on aspirin, but that doesn't mean it's very likely. And as far as aspirin goes, look, I'm not giving any medical advice here, and I don't want people to try to overdose on aspirin and then come back and point the finger at me. What I'm saying is aspirin is a surprisingly tolerable medicine for the body. And while it's not unheard of to be abused, it's fairly rare. And so among all the problems that you could have with your health, taking too much aspirin usually is pretty low on the list. And I think when I look at the Calvinists who are learning Calvinist doctrine to share it with people, I'm not seeing it myself in the sense that we don't make a golden statue of John Calvin. Bradster, Bradster, unless you will, something you're not telling me, I don't have a golden statue of John Calvin in my room that I bow down to. When I get on my knees at night and I go before my Lord in prayer, I don't open up and say, you know, our Father who art in heaven, John Calvin be thy name. I don't say that. And what else? I don't, we don't do anything in terms of being imitative of Calvin, except in one dimension. And that is this. You already mentioned John Calvin had this, I'm trying to think of the best word, he had this crusading interest in getting every bit of divine truth out of the Holy Scriptures that God has put there. And so if imitating him in that way is enough to get me labeled as worshiping John Calvin, well, again, I think that's there's a passive aggressiveness there. Now, over and above the fact that I think you and I have probably done an examination, I have. People have made the accusation, you just want to do this, you want to exalt that, you just want your own specific tribe, your own specific cult, and it goes on and on. And I think each of us have to take stock of where we are. Am I really doing that? And as best I can tell, Bradster, I'm not. And I don't think anybody who's not a Calvinist, but who is a Christian, who is in my life, and I'm thinking here of family and friends, people who are in my social circle, people who rub elbows with me in the days in, day in and day out of life. Not one of them have made that accusation. So I think we want to push back on 
these critics and say, are you disqualifying yourself with this accusation right out of the gate? Are you marking yourself as a troll right out of the gate? Now, look, I'm not trying to just be partisan and declare victory. But at the same point in time, there is a supremacy to the scriptures that I see in the best of Calvinistic scholarship that I do not see in almost every other Christian denomination. Now, somebody's going to listen to this and get mad and get in a huff. Oh, he's saying none of us love to be Bible scholars. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is when you put, when you look at the best or the people who I've evaluated to be the best after 40 plus years of being a believer and reading the scriptures, I would say maybe eight out of 10, maybe nine out of 10 of the theologians and exegetes who I think have weighed the scriptures in the most mature fashion, I would say eight out of 10, maybe nine out of 10 have been Calvinists, have been reformed. That does, that strikes me that as, as not being an, ex, an accident. And so there's something about this Bradster that really compels me to want to push past this sort of trollishly dismissive accusation of worship. How would you build on that when you're thinking of receiving such an input from somebody? See, that's the problem, guys. It's not that you're saying I'm a Calvinist just to say I'm better than you, but you're saying these are the set of beliefs that I hold to. Spiritual death is true. God saves men. Spiritual death is true. God saves men. Are there wacky people in the Calvinist corner? I'm sure, you know, down the line. And I promise you this, they're not confessional. Confessional creeds, all these things, I will go out on a limb to say they're a gift from God. Second London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, I don't find any mistakes in it that I can point out and say, hey, look at that. But I promise you that, I promise you this, every heretic and their brother do. I promise you that. So what what is the problem with being a confessional Calvinist. I'll tell you what the problem is. You can get puffed up for being the beacon of truth. You can say, hey, I'm this guy that knows it all. But that's not what we're saying. But if we are treated that way and we go along with it and give people that ground to establish such ideology, then that's the only way that this is going to come about. So it's your own error. You need to be patient to explain to people, hey, this is actually, I don't even think the creed, correct me if I'm wrong, because I know my brother JT bears into the second London with me. I don't think it mentions Calvinism a single time, does it? Not by name. Amen. So whenever people are like, oh, you're a confessional, so you're over there confessing John Calvin. The creed, the confession doesn't even mention his name a single time, guys. You see this. I mean, I've never got the gif, man, you're a man-made follower, a man-made doctrine. You're just wild and goofy and all this. But I promise you this, every heretic and their brother will disagree with that creed and teach some goofy stuff that is unorthodox without fail, because this is how it's treated. Here's the Bible coming down from heaven. Bam! It's right in your hands, right? And now I'm going to interpret it. I open it up. I don't need history. I don't need doctrine that's pinned down by elders that God establishes. He gives to the church, first apostles, then prophets, then evangelists, then teachers, preachers, shepherds. Yeah, this is God's doing. God brings all things. Well, guess what? He also brought the teachers that taught you. What did the eunuch say to Philip, how can I know unless someone teaches me? So I say it's a tremendous error to stay away from these confessions, the right ones, that is, the ones that agree with biblical Calvinism. But is it mandatory to say, hey, Apostles' Creed, and then, you know, this is the format of all Christians every... I don't see any ground for that in Scripture. I don't think Scripture expresses there's going to come about this creed, and you shall forever confess it. And I don't believe it does that. But then again, if we get past the kids stuff and we put our milk bottle down for a second and actually open up the Apostles' Creed, we see that it's things that we should affirm. But are we to chant it at a church? Where does it tell me to do that in Scripture? I'll pass it over to J.C. Bear with that one. Thank you for that, brother. Where this gets interesting 
almost immediately is in the situation where somebody sees the Great Commission, the call for you, the person who believes in Christ, to then go and reflect and teach about Christ, follow the Great Commission, proclaim, make disciples. Because what will happen immediately, and you and I've talked about this before, my friend, when I first started in the jail ministry, I was spent some time training. <laughs> I had taken a lot of courses and was ready to have a discipleship class and teaching ministry. And when I went into the first session inside of the jail and the jail cell closes behind you and there you are locked up in that room with 25, 30 men for the next two hours, what I was surprised was to find that they all knew religion better than me, or at least they were pretty sure they did. And so I thought, wow, why, why have I spent 40 years reading these scriptures when I could have just learned everything about God from the folks here in this jail cell with me? Now, I don't say that to make light of those folks in the jail cell with me. I loved those men. We had a great time. But I wasn't under the impression for one moment that the Jesus they were talking about was the Jesus from the Scriptures. What I tended to find was, and it would vary slightly for each person, is that people thought they knew about God because they had their own private revelation. So maybe one man says to me, oh, I had dreams about God and is what God's like, because he's come to me and he said this in my dreams. And then someone else says, well, I know what God's like because I grew up and our traditions taught us that we could think about God in this certain way. And that's where I learned about what God's like. And then somebody else would say, well, I learned about God by going to worship. And there in that worship experience, it would come to me and I would have this personal intimacy with the divine. And still someone else would say, well, I know about God because I have a mind, and I have used that mind to reason, put facts together in a series of statements, and built up conclusions about reality from it. And then finally, somebody would say, well, I know about God because I've lived life, and in the life I've lived, these life lessons have become very clear to me. And what I would do over and over again every single time, with no disrespect meant to my friends, is I would say to them, but what do the Scriptures say? And then we would pull out the Scriptures, and we would start going through the Scriptures. And then all of a sudden, personal opinion and individual sensibilities about the way reality ought to be didn't really matter. And we were going through those Scriptures together. And how could those words of God be communicated to these hungry hearts. And that is when you're doing theology. And what I found was over and over again, like tools in a tool shop, like best friends when you're going out to work, the creeds and the confessions offered support. They offered good ways to answer perennial questions. Now, the creeds never took over. The creeds never dominated. The creeds never said, you must only think exactly the way we have worded in this creed. But what they have done is they successfully pointed to the God of the Scriptures. And so what I would do to these men who through revelation, who through tradition, who through worship, reason, or experience, were sure they, had, they knew God, and they knew what mattered to Him, and they knew what it would take to be in His favor, is I pushed through all of that, and I opened up the Scriptures, and I put that text in front of them, and I said, what does this say? And then they would read it. And then after we would read it, we would say, when the text says this, what does it mean? Now, I didn't say, what does it mean in the sense that they themselves were doing the deciding or bringing the meaning to it, but it was this idea, engage, engage the faculties to understand the scriptures and to make them primary. And so, Bradster, when I did that, what I found was I had something that hungry hearts could grab onto. And that made all the difference. Let me throw it over to you, Bradster, for some follow on with that. You can just walk up to somebody and say, hey, the Father gives, the Spirit does, and Jesus Christ saves. I can say the Father gave the Son from heaven by the Holy Spirit into the womb of the Virgin Mary, where then he came out, lived a blameless life, true God, true righteous man, the only man to have ever been. 100% righteous because he was 100% God. And he was offered up for sins that he didn't commit, but 
by a lawless hand, the predestined plan of God was accomplished whenever he was nailed to a tree. Cursed is every man who hangs from a tree. And this tree that he was cursed upon was not his wrongdoing, but it was the sins of the elect. All the elect, every last one of them, the whole of them, whosoever, everyone who believed, whatsoever their name was, was all written in heaven from the foundation of the world. And anyone who places their trust in Jesus Christ by the regenerated work of the Spirit, just as he sent the Son into the world, and just as he raised the Son up from the dead on the third day, shall be saved. Now, that doesn't exactly fit in your pocket, but I can tell you this, whether you accept this or not, I could just say Calvinism, and you could look it up online, and it would teach the same thing. So how in the world is Calvinism a bad thing? Unless you can pinpoint and prove in Holy Scripture that what I said is inaccurate, which I challenge people to do that all the time for their own good, unless you can do that then you have no right to say nothing about Calvinism. And with that being said, I want to go into the scripture real quick. I love the scriptures. All, every verse is wonderful. Even the ones that Arminianism thinks is theirs. They're all God. It's all predestined. But let's get into the scriptures a second. First Corinthians chapter one. What do we have in terms of the baptism passages? Can we get those read real quick, brother? Give me that verse again, brother. First Corinthians chapter one, I was baptized by Paul. Paul is all that mentioning about the different people that they were baptized by. I think it's like around 12. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized in my name. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Emptied of its power. And then if we keep reading, this is what we have. The cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but for us who are being saved, being saved, being saved. It is the power of God. Is he talking about sovereign grace theology? Is he talking about, well, you you say you were baptized with this guy, and you say you were baptized with that guy, and we're making divisions about our baptism? Does that have anything to do with biblical determinism? Is that God shunning his own scriptures whenever he says, all things work by the counsel of his will? Is that God saying, no one can come to the Son except the Father who sent him draws them, and they will be raised up on the last day? Is that God putting himself up against himself? Is he contradicting himself? No, no. We should be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. How? In the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, which Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity. The funny thing that I find with all this is instead of looking into things deeper, like this was in the same chapter, guys, what I just pointed out, he chooses the weak things to shame the strong, the foolish things to shame the wise. He says, if you want to boast, boast in the Lord. He's the one who does it all. And people use these scriptures to try to disprove Calvinism, it's ridiculous. I've never heard such a, of a ridiculous bunch of shenanigans. And then we continue, we have Matthew 15, where it talks about the doctrines of men. Now, in the Talmud, they used to write things, and they're adding extra teachings, extra commands to God's Word. Now, are we adding extra, or are we simply expounding on the scriptures? See, that's the difference, guys. You need to get some context there, 
and the rest shall set you free, if you will. We have an opportunity to examine the text of one of the classic confessions, and we mentioned it earlier, that is to say the Apostles' Creed. Now, if there has ever been a, a single summary statement of Christianity, this, this might be it. And historically speaking, this creed had a lot of mileage with it in antiquity. So during the time of the early church, during the time into the Middle Ages, and even through the Middle Ages and into the modern times, this creed has always been a great short creed that if someone affirms this creed with their whole heart, then I am very happy to recognize them as a brother in the Lord. And let me take a, a moment here and read it and listen at how it's simple, straightforward, and yet it says a lot in a very compact way. So the Apostles' Creed says this, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand, God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, Bradster, these are not, this is a, a creedal statement. This is a subordinate standard. This is the scriptures being summarized rather than taking the place of the scripture. But for just three short paragraphs of text, it's really got a lot to say. Wouldn't you agree? Amen. The thing about this particular creed, guys, is I really cannot find a single disagreement. I could see how maybe someone would nitpick over the term hell, that he descended to hell. But I mean, I was reading through the Heidelberg Catechism, and this is taken as all the pain that Christ took on the cross when he was crushed by the Father. I believe that's true. And I think there's wiggle room for extra understanding there, like Jesus going to say the Old Testament saints and things like that from Hades, which would be the side which is Abraham's bosom, or the classic view of Hades where he actually suffered for our sins in, in hell, literally. There's wiggle room there with that. A lot of people get freaked out about the part that says Catholic, but that's even in the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, guys. Catholic is universal. It's pretty much like saying all the believers in the whole world and, and being literal about it, like the believers everywhere, you know. This applies to all the believers. This is a good understanding. I would say a great understanding for anyone with a positive confession. What, what about you, J.C. Bear? I think that's so well said. It's a good analysis, brother. Here's what I've noticed. I can get almost all of the bang for the buck talking with somebody by just going through the Apostles' Creed with them, as I could get if we had the time to go through the 31 chapters of the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, or the 1100 plus chapters of the Bible itself. So we're here talking about having actual concrete discussions, introductory discussion, discussions with people who have a major, a major, they've not been introduced to some of these most important factual matters of the Christian faith. And so I can ask them, after we've had a gospel presentation, do you believe in God the Father Almighty, that he is the creator of heaven and earth? And right away, people are able to articulate yes or no. Now, surprisingly, well, 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 Christians, of course, will say yes, but surprisingly, if people say no, what instead comes out is, well, I've got questions. But I've learned that, well, I've got questions from a pragmatic sense is almost always, no, I don't believe. So then I'll ask, well, why don't you believe? Well, I have concerns about A, B, C, and D. And then we go through and we have a conversation, how wonderful that is. And so to have a creed that is so easy to step through, and talk through. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, that he's the only son of God the Father, that he's our Lord, 
that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born fully God, fully man of the Virgin Mary? That's a pretty direct question. And people will, and you'll find very quickly that these truths separate. It's very difficult to be on the fence about them one way or the other, you know, to, to just be, well, I do believe in Jesus Christ, but I'm not sure that he is this, that he's that, or that he's fully the other. What you tend to have is you tend to have these very blanket yeses and these very blanket noes. Now, maybe that's been different throughout history. Certainly, people have responded differently in the sense that there have been other doctrinal issues that have been the most questioned, been the most apologetic interest in. And it seems almost like the church basically has to reinvent apologetics every generation for a new generation. But that's okay. That's why we're here. We who love the Lord have a beautiful task. And as my friend the Bradster and I have both said separately, there are people out there who can make a better presentation than we can. But there's nobody out there with a better gospel. And so, brother, in terms of dividing, in terms of laying it out and asking people to come off the fence one way or another, I think this creed has to be, has to be one of your go-to creeds in your bag when you're talking to somebody about Christ. And when, even when you're making a summary statement like this, just three paragraphs of text in the English translation, you're still doing theology. You're still making doctrinal statements that are built upon the truth of Scripture. Let me throw it over to you for some follow-up. All Protestants, all Protestants should not reject the ecumenical creeds. These creeds are very important to the church, but they are defense-oriented. They are something that keeps us away from error. They're not necessarily what we have to say whenever we go to church on Sunday. If we put it as something that we have to say, then we're putting that equal with the Scripture. If we use these as teaching tools, if we say, hey, here is the Apostles' Creed, and I teach my brother what the Bible is conveying through this creed, What's the difference between doing that and using your favorite pastor's article? Well, I'll tell you this. If they disagree with that creed, then something's wrong with their article. How do I know this? Is there not one God? Do we not have a monotheistic religion? Is there not a triune nature to that God? Do we not have Father, Son, Holy Spirit in distinct roles in their personages? Is there not one Lord, one Jesus Christ? that we must all submit to. Like I've said again, I'll say it again. Is there not one place that we go if we are not with him? Is there not one place that we are going to definitely go if we are with him? Is there not one true church, which means do we not all have the Holy Spirit if we're believers? How in God's creation can you disagree with this creed and say, yeah, I'm a Christian? That would you would have a lot of ops to jump through and a lot of hoops and hurdles, I promise, friend. It would be a really odd, open theistic realm or something to play in that is very unhealthy and illogical. I would highly recommend the study of the of the, all these creeds, like the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. And there's, what I think there's either three or four that are really important. How, uh, which ones are those, J.C. Bear? Brother, we should probably talk about that, because there are probably, like you say, three or four that are very stunningly important, but you really have to build them up and go through why they are. So some of the other ones would be the Nation Creed, the formula at Chalcedon. So I would say those two, coupled with the Apostles' Creed, are three of the biggest of the creedal statements that come out of antiquity, and then they develop further as time goes on. Amen. Appreciate that. What I find most remarkable is the rejection of even looking at these things and the dismissal and just calling it, ah, that's Roman Catholic. I'd never pay no mind to anything like that. I didn't know you were part of the Council of Trent and Vatican II. I, I, I thought we were talking about the early church creeds of the early church forefathers. I believe this topic is often overlooked by well-intending. I wouldn't say that you're a heretic if you're unwilling to engage with these creeds if you fully love the Lord your God 
through the person of Jesus Christ who died on a tree to sin. But it's a tremendous error to overlook good information that is helpful to our faith and to treat the saints of old as if, I don't know, they weren't martyred for the faith that you hold dear to, that they weren't trying to stay away from error, that they weren't making every attempt to stay away from error so that we could have a brighter future in the faith. They didn't write it for themselves, guys. Nobody wrote this for themselves. You do not confess Christ for yourself. You do it because you're a beacon of hope to a brother to come, to a brother that is. And it's a testimony that is undeniable if Christ is in your heart. I think there's one other interesting aspect here, and that is the idea, that is the idea of the teachability of the saints. Now, I get it. I get it maybe as well as anyone, and Bradster gets it too. We've all seen, we've all seen that one security guard who let the authority go to his head, and pretty soon he's acting like he's the one true security guard. We've all seen that. What was that movie, Paul Blart, Mall Cop, or something like that? And uh, Bradster and I are keenly aware that could be a criticism leveled us. But having said that, it's almost self-refuting because we, we're saying nothing like that. We're saying, search the scriptures. Here's what you're going to find. You're going to find something very close to what is summarized in these creeds. Not only that, but these creeds are really helpful study guides. The students today, when they, Bradster, when I was young, I'm so old that when I was a student, you know, our textbooks were, were carved into stone. Okay, I'm not quite that old. When I was young, they were just coming out in the universities with the, this newfangled thing called a study guide. And so you'd have the textbook, and then corresponding with the textbook, you'd have this study guide. And the study guide was just this small little booklet. And the whole point and purpose of that small little booklet was to help you get through that big, thick textbook. And so I think that's the right and proper way to think of these creedal statements. For the student who loves the scriptures, it's going to be hard to go wrong if you stick with these standard creeds and confession. Now, I say hard to go wrong, not because people can't go wrong. If there's anything 40 years of being a Christian has taught me, it's that if there's a way for people to go wrong, they will find it. But if you latch on to this as a study guide, it will bless you immeasurably. It will change your life for the better. And so I think that's what you and I are hoping to communicate, brother. We're not looking to establish our own private empire. We're not looking to set up John Calvin statue across the land for people to bow down to. But I think we, I think you and I see, as well as the Calvinists throughout history, that there's a great temptation to fall away from that scriptural authority, from that scriptural base. There's a great temptation to make one's self God, to make one's self the authority, to look inside of one's self in matters of right and wrong. And if we do that, we may be following a God. But brother, as you've pointed out, it is not the God of the Scripture. And so that's the important thing to remember here. And hopefully this is encouraging rather than depressing. Hopefully this is uplifting rather than scolding. And with that in mind, brother, I think I'm just going to turn it over to you for some final thoughts and closing prayer. What gets me every time is whenever I hear somebody saying, thank God I'm not like that Arminian. Thank God I'm not like those Calvinists. It really blows my mind how much they sound like that Pharisee Jesus was talking about. But we know we're all that sometimes. Sometimes we're all the idiot. And every single time we need Jesus, he's always the answer, guys. And quite often, he does get overlooked when you're arguing theology. But when you're making it, on the other hand, all about him, because he's made everything all about his son. Nothing builds us up quite like that. It's beautiful that we come together and declare Jesus Christ King. All the different ways it's been done, whether you're a Lutheran, a Baptist, whether you're Calvinist of any creed, Reformed tradition, Presbyterian, Reformed Baptist, New Calvinist, NCT, whatever you want to call yourself. One thing we all have in common is we're pointing at Jesus Christ as that final goal, that ultimate goal the prize, the treasure at the end of God's rainbow. So Noah was saved through water, so are we saved from a good conscience towards God. 
that leads us to baptism. Dear Father, we ask that all our idiocy be overlooked, all our foolishness. We are all just men. We say things that men ought not to say about you, even when we confess the good things of who you really are. We love you. We're no better than any of these out of the camp. We're no better than any person inside, and we're only inside the camp because you took us from outside the camp. You save us through our field, and you do it by your Spirit. Thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you, dear Father. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for your sacrifice. Once and for all, the sake of the elect, we pray. Amen.